Even without knowing the prologue to this film is going to be a flashback, there's an entirely different tone to the opening notes even if they still lead into the Rings theme. I'll just never get over the blending of different themes by Howard Shore. And again, resolving on an upbeat note at the sight of hobbits even though it's a false sense of security this time. So is this Andy Serkis just being Andy Serkis, Smeagol enjoying the simpler things like fishing in general, or Smeagol showing signs of being a sadistic crazy person really enjoying hooking the worm? Always wondered. Any of the three are a win. And as I mentioned at Fellowship, same shot used then. A great opening that really pulls focus back to the ring since it barely came up in two towers. Ooh, the ring instantly ensnares Smeagol. Not making excuses, but it's interesting that it's actually Deagle who strangles Smeagol first. Though Smeagol does finish the job. Can't help but appreciate that heartbeat worked into the score, slowly petering out. And as always, a Smeagol transforming into Gollum montage is the fastest way to turn Lord of the Rings into a horror movie and Gollum into a kitty cat. Quick reminder for us that while Frodo acts tough, the ring has taken a hold of him. So, like, precious shadowing. Is it midday yet? The days are growing darker. The first real mention of Sauron's cloud to protect his orcs is right from Frodo in the beginning. Every scene transition, a score transition, that even across hundreds or possibly thousands of miles, the leitmotif carries you over and connects all our heroes. Everything always works together. It's probably a no-brainer for the continuity department, but I love that the Misty Mountains are in the background, tying into the continuity of Saruman creating that avalanche and fellowship. You were deep in the enemy's council. So you have come here for information? His attack will come soon. You're all going to die. Another scene that totally works for the extended and answers what happened to Saruman, but really was mostly unnecessary for the theatrical, feels like backtracking, so good call cutting it. Super glad it still exists. Grima, come down. Be free of him. Showing the merciful side of Theoden, even to Grima, who had poisoned his mind for so long. Ha! <laughs> Kerr. Remember last week? I don't. Come up, it's also a brutal but appropriate way to kill Count Dracula. Also, this is exactly why you don't put spikes on water wheels, if you needed a reason. Our composer Howard Shore, he definitely deserves to be seen in this one. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them both. Sure, when Gollum does it, it's creepy, but when Bender does it, it's funny. Double standard much? Crawling up to the water to have a conversation with Gollum where they just used camera cuts on either side of the tree to dissociate last time. <laughs> Gollum and Smeagol even have different pupil dilations. Who will have took? Ugh, the line he so casually said before immediately dismissed when he realizes that Pippin is in actual danger. You smoke too much, Pippin. Health advice. Oh, hope and memory. What a piece of music. Since before we were tweens. Wait, tweens? Lord of the Rings invented tweens? We cannot delay. Figwit, play our song to keep her going. Really building up the splendor that is Minas Tirith by constantly cutting to these panning wides and not rushing the ascent. To give him news of his beloved son's death would be most unwise. I do not mention further the ring and say nothing of Aragorn either. In fact, it's better if you don't speak at all, Perkin too. Discretion advice. Subtle touch you may not notice is that there is a higher throne above Denethor that's for the king while he sits in the steward's chair. The rule of Gondor is mine! Let's talk about Dr. Walter Bishop here for a second. Peter Jackson talks a lot about how John Noble has a background as a stage actor, and man was he the right cast for this movie. Conveying insanity and then powerful rage, but he's also hunched over showing the broken down man that he truly is. I totally get why this is cut. Gandalf is literally waxing philosophical about a city, but the sweeping pans are still gorgeous. We're going there and back again. Encouragement in the form of book titles. Yeah, smoking is bad for you, especially when you trade your old gray lungs in for new white ones. There never was much hope. Just a fool's hope. Honesty with a side of optimism. Uh, I don't have anything left witty to say. There's Peter Jackson again. I give him credit for the amount of makeup this time. Gotta love the way the camera falls all over itself, letting us inside Frodo's mind as he's being pulled to Minas Morgul. Such a great way of tying our characters together who have been apart for so long by witnessing the same crazy event. And speaking of camera movements, how about that pan down? Hmm. There are a few things I love about the beacon lighting scene. 
First is thinking about the guys whose job it is to just hang out and wait to see a fire from either side. Sounds like a boring, albeit potentially exhilarating job, but more importantly is the visuals we get. That brief moment of trying to find the stack of wood on the horizon before the fire is actually lit. Having your eyes fixed on one and not noticing the other until it lights up the sky. The crazy long shots as we follow the beacon through the night across Middle Earth. And obviously Howard Shore's score pretty much makes you want to stand up and salute Gondor. Or, well, Pippin, I guess. <laughs> Ooh, that's a little teamwork. Brutal. Grabbed by Nazgul dragon talons and thrown into stone walls? There's a fun little characterization of Gothmog where he's super insecure about his malformities. Madril glances at his hand, prompting him to stab a dying, immobilized man out of spite to look tough. Spoke too soon on the brutal. Gandalf to the rescue again. Ooh, and these choral voices coinciding with his beam of light breaking through the chaos and noise around the Nazgul attack. Okay, that's insane, and I never really considered this before, but they've been climbing for quite a while. 20 minutes in film time. I think they stopped for the night on this cliff, though they may be higher, but either way, the orc army is still marching out. Gives you a pretty solid idea of how large it is. You will ask you for it. The fat one will take it from you. Clairvoyance, and I hate to praise masterful manipulation, but masterful manipulation from Gollum. Not that Poisoned Mind Frodo is a tough target. You wish now that our places had been exchanged, that I had died and Boromir had lived. Yes, I wish that. Can you even imagine? I actually can't. Since you were robbed of Boromir, I will do what I can in his stead. If I should return, think better of me, father. But David Wenham creates a moment here caught somewhere between complete despair and betrayal and trying to win his father's love. Also, holy cow, Faramir is Harold Meacham. That's just, like, the creepiest? Of all the jump scare, eye-opening scenes in horror movies, Gollum knowing that Sam was waiting for him to be asleep and having some sixth sense about it? <laughs> Another few things. Just the fact that the climb is so long that they have to sleep on the mountain, such a powerful image. Fortunately, hobbits don't roll in their sleep at all, and another awesome pan down shot. Every shot from up on the stairs is just breathtaking. And also, Snook! Snook! What were you doing? Snook. Oh, honesty. You can't help me anymore. Go home. That'll crush your soul. The one person who's always been there, completely destroyed because Gollum knows exactly how to exploit the power of the ring. Loud and Rough couple of scenes here. The double juxtaposition of Pippin's angelic yet melancholy voice against Faramir riding to his death mirrored in Denethor's gluttonous, bone-breaking, and purposefully sloppy eating. You don't need to see the actual battle, cause... Wow, I totally thought that was a shot added for the extended, but apparently just slightly enhanced. The Ghost King was in there for the theatrical. They will answer to the King of Gondor. Hugo Weaving gets just a sliver of screen time and shows why he's always a win. Generosity, and what a triumphant score to compliment it. Also, I know I said the books are different works of art, but holding on to this scene until now gives the sword and Aragorn's destiny to be king a lot more poignancy this far in. It is but a shadow on a thought that you love. That's like the gentlest it's me not you let down ever. Good on you, Aragorn. Any woman is going to be devastated no matter the cause. Just the idea that the giant trolls are most valuable at this point banging drums because of how powerful the terror they're instilling in Gondor would be. I'd say pairing a ghost sword with your newly formed Dark Lord killing sword classifies as a badass good guy thing to do. What Seems like a foregone conclusion, but if you really think about it, they do actually have a choice. Kill these three and keep on living the way they live, or fight for them. I like that it's not like they're compelled to fight for Aragorn just because of his blood and the sword. <laughs> How did the Skull Avalanche not make it into the final cut? We fight. Barbosa was always a man of his word, but this is another scene I'm glad was left on the cutting room floor for the theatrical. It's fine once you've seen the movie, but the tension when Aragorn enters the battle later is diminished. Second moment of Gothmog trying to look cool and being embarrassed when he stumbles. My point is that he could have just been another Lurtz. It's the same actor, after all, but he's unique. Man, that pan up. So perfect. Since we know that Denethor hasn't been even remotely paying attention as tens of thousands of orcs formed outside his walls. The tension building up before this battle is similar to Helm's Deep in outcome, I guess, but it's completely different in tone, style, and execution. Denethor hasn't prepared anyone, civilians are still in the streets when the rocks start flying, the soldiers look completely lost until Gandalf takes control. <laughs> yep, also comeuppance. <laughs> 
timing win? Also, setting this battle in daytime sets it apart from Helm's Deep, as well as trebuchets and catapults and Nazgul flying around killing dudes. You can say one thing for the orcs, they always have some great siege plans. <laughs> Saving a pool of a toque. This is no place for a hobbit! It is, however, clearly a place for a wizard. Badass good guy over here, too. <laughs> Doug's dead. What is this place? We call it the Dolly Zoom Cave. This is already getting pretty nopey, but it really hasn't gotten there yet. Yeah, nope. What on the run, sir? And here I thought Gollum was great with songs. Kate Blanchett is always a win, even when she's just a helpful hallucination. Better to die sooner than late, for die we must. Denethor is a really annoying sad sack, but he's also a great contrast and setup for the hope that's coming. No matter what comes through that gate, you will stand your ground! Whoops, never mind, it's trolls in armor, bail, everyone, we're gonna bail. Man, I love Gandalf in this movie, the leader, the warrior, the only one in white. Did I mention nope? <laughs> Still a solid nope, but I can't help but love the low angle camera torturing us. Never thought I'd use this one, but skip. Yeah, still a nope, but loving the way she lob pulls those whatever they are, I'm not looking it up. Like a boxer who just took one on the chin. This is my power. Flaming sword. <gasps> Another spot where I've got to give it to theatrical. The flow is just much better. I don't care about the impact on the Witch King. I care about Gondor. You've got Gandalf telling them. Fight! Fight to the last man! And then instead of a silly ex machina save of Gandalf, the Rohan horn silences the battle. A sword day! A red day! And the sun rises! Well, that beats his woe is me speech before Helm's Deep, ironically, when the odds are even worse. Straight up courage. Yeah! I mean, it's a little morbid, but still courageous. The Battle of Pelennor Fields. 6,000 horses is a sight to see, but this moment, their absolute sacrificial attitude as they charge in, literally chanting death, almost ironically underselling how insanely impactful 6,000 horses charging through stationary orcs will actually be, and the Ride of the Rohirrim theme. Oh man, does it all tie together and make for one of the most triumphant moments in the film. Those horns and strings. Again, the comparison to Helm's Deep can't be ignored, but what a totally different aesthetic and feeling of finality to this battle. <laughs> Brutal and awesome. Guys, we, we doing this? Are we really doing this? Come up and sir, come down and Can't even imagine running like half a mile on fire, but also a yup for the visuals. Oof, that look on Theoden's face. I love that they were so briefly introduced in Two Towers, so you get the feeling that maybe that's what's coming. Everything about this insanity is brutal, but still so entertaining. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Badass good girl. No man can kill me. I am no man. Badass no man and a little more brutal crushing inside your own helmet. <laughs> Just another dead orc and he's moving on. One last theatrical superiority. Listen to this score as Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli advance on the field. It's like the full culmination of the Fellowship theme, as powerful as can be. Willifont? All right, as cheesy as this entire sequence is, and don't get me wrong, I still love it. Legolas the Super Elf is always fun to watch, and no, it's not like he could just do this to every single one. Or he could, and it doesn't matter since they have Ghost Army now anyway. But you've got to admit that that's some resourcefulness. Cutting the ropes of the... Is this still considered a howda? Whatever it is, cutting it free and riding it up to the top. Right, so those are the good guys swarming that thing, right? Gotta give Eowyn some credit for holding back her tears until after Theoden dies allowing him his redemption moment. So the implication is that they slaughtered each other just because the ring was in close proximity? Wait, but Sam actually had it. So it's just a statement about evil groups not being able to get along? I'm good with that. I guess that's why Sauron creates hundreds of thousands of them. All right, so you guys are all used to the two-parters for Lord of the Rings, right? Yes, I know, The Last Jedi was 42 minutes long, and this is only gonna add up to like a little over a half hour. But, you know, I've set a precedent, so I'm just gonna keep going with it. Also, I'm just completely burnt out and my brain is mush. <laughs> but part two is coming Friday. All right, see you in a few days.